With the United States now in the war, Wilson's diplomacy is going to pick up, especially when the war turns in the favor of the Allies. What did Wilson say he wanted as a basis to end the war, peace without victory? Well, in January of 1918, he announces a specific blueprint for that peace without victory, called the 14 Points. They were specifics to implement a peace, according to Wilson. Now, the first five points were very general talking about no secret diplomacy, freedom of the seas. The next eight points talked about a redrawing of the map of Europe. Basically, they called it a self-determination of peoples. So if you were a, a, a specific ethnic group and you don't have a nation, guess what? You're about to get one. He's kind of like playing Oprah. Remember Oprah had that one episode where he was like, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, right? Well, just change car to country. You get a country, you get a country, right? So nations like Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Poland, they're all born as a result of this. Right? The ironic thing, of course, is that some of these nations that are created after World War I don't exist anymore. But nevertheless, Wilson's biggest point, the one that he would sell his mother to slavery, is going to be the 14th point. It calls for the creation of an agency for international collective security known as the League of Nations. What this meant is that all nations, all member nations, would combine and protect one another from aggression. Yet to get to a, get it adopted, all you have to do is save the world from its own history. Because the history of the world was anything but international collective security. Mostly it was a, a history, mostly it was one country overrunning another for, another, for whatever reason. Now as the war came to an end and Germany was losing, which country do you think they're going to turn to when it comes to settling, settling this whole thing? How about the United States, who's talking about peace without victory? And that's what they did. And Wilson was playing a very key role in the signing of an armistice that ended, that, that's going to begin on November 11th, 1918. For a long time, November 11th was known as Armistice Day. Now here in the United States, it's called Veterans Day. The armistice ends the war by basically stopping the killing. The war, the, you know, stopping the shelling, the bullets, the gas, everything. Right, and the peace settlement would be worked out. Now, Wilson is going to make a major blunder. In fact, makes a couple of blunders. The first blunder he's going to make is going to be that he's going to announce that he's going to go to Paris and negotiate the settlement. He's going to negotiate the peace. Right. Well, unfortunately for Wilson, his colleagues, the leaders of of uh, Britain, of Italy, and, and of France, the last thing they want to do is show up to Paris and negotiate a peace. All right. So, but nevertheless, he's going to go and he's going to help negotiate uh, the peace, what we call the Treaty of Versailles. Now, that's a very hard thing to do, and there's going to be two major obstacles when it comes when it comes to Wilson that made him made, that he makes mistakes on. The first thing is the fact that in November of 1918, when the war comes to end. He, the United States is going to have to ter have midterm elections, right? All of the House and one third of the Senate. Generally speaking, it's probably best for the President of the United States to remain re remain quiet because they don't they don't depend on what the President wants, right? These elections don't depend on what the President wants. But if he's going to say anything. He should simply have said, "Elect those who will support me and what I'm trying to do. I don't care about party." Yet he asked the American people to elect all Democrats, his party. The mistake here is that at the local level, there are people that are not elected based on what the president wants. And instead, they're elected on local issues. So in one move, Wilson has based his administration's future in one election. He was trying to get his agenda into these elections. Now, there were reasons for him to do it. One of them being the many Democrats who were begging for his support in the campaigns. And Wilson was also very aggravated at what some Republican families were doing, such as Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt even tried to create a volunteer unit to go to war. Luckily, he wasn't able to go. Yet, he, didn't, he did go around making speeches at recruitment rallies. The sad part of this is when his favorite son, Quentin, was killed over the era of France. So when Wilson signs the armistice, Roosevelt says, let's not chat about peace to the accompaniment of, dictate, of clicking typewriters. Let's dictate peace to the hammering guns. Well, Wilson doesn't like these types of things. 
being said about him. So he endorsed the Democratic candidates. And guess who won the elections? The Republicans. They won, back, they won both houses of Congress. The Senate here is what really matters because of the fact that it's the Senate that is going to have to, be, have to ratify the treaty. And you need a two-thirds majority. The Senate had 49 Republicans and 47 Democrats. So he does now have a serious problem. Now, here's something simple. If you're Wilson and you're, and you're about to go to Paris and negotiate, you need to take a team with you. And who are you going to take? Well, you should take some really important Republicans with you and help them negotiate and get them involved to such a degree that the opposite party can't just simply oppose you when you return home. It makes sense. Well, unfortunately, the most important Republican, the time, Republican during this time period was a man named Henry Cabot Lodge. Lodge was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This is where the treaty would first show up in the Senate. But for personal reasons, Lodge and Wilson hated one another from conflicts in the past. So Wilson would not take Lodge, and he certainly wouldn't take Teddy Roosevelt. How about Taft? No, he didn't take him either. Or in fact, he didn't take a single Republican. It turned into a purely Democratic affair. So this is not really hard to understand that this was a mistake. Wilson was one of those people who thought he's, he knew he was just right, and therefore, in his eyes, he could not fail. Wilson leaves for Paris, the first time a sitting president of the United States leaves the Western Hemisphere. The Paris Peace Conference lasts for almost two years, from 1919 to 1920. He negotiated five different treaties with each of the central powers involved in a war. But the one that really matters is the one with Germany, known as the Treaty of Versailles, a suburb of Paris and also the place where the treaty was negotiated. Most of the decisions during the negotiations at Versailles were made by a group of men known as the Big Four. Lloyd George of Britain, Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France, and Wilson of the United States. Now, do you think it's really possible for Wilson to, be in, to walk in a room with these guys and get everything he wants? Of course not. So compromises and concessions will be made. And I'll give you two. Number one, Germany would lose all of her colonies. Is that peace without victory? I don't think so. And by the way, so did all the other countries that lost as well. Now, these colonies were not made independent. They were given to the winners in something that was known as a mandate. The colonies of the defeated nations were given to the winners as mandates, and just for fun was this area in the Middle East that belonged to the Turks, and it was chopped up and given to the British as a mandate. Anybody want to guess what that place is called? Oh yeah, Iraq, right? We see the after effects of combining Shia, Sunni, and Kurdish people into one area. Syria was given to the French. Now, as for the second concession, Britain and France wanted to be paid for the damages done by the Germans. So the treaty called for reparations on the part of Germany. And by the way, how do you figure out the bill for all that lost property and lives that Germany was going to have to pay for? They were blamed for the war, and what's known as the war guilt cause, and Basically, Germany had to pay $33 billion, which would wreak havoc of the German economy in the 1920s. As to why Wilson did this, he really believed that if you just get the treaty with the League of Nations in it, everything would work out. Wilson made his concessions partly because he had to, and partly because he believed he would be able to get that League of Nations.